good afternoon students we had a, a discussion on the basics of memory management uh, that was before we started seeing the code of the x36 bootloader and uh, we will continue our discussion on memory management in your textbook the topic on memory management is covered quite later but uh, in our scheme of the course we will cover it earlier because uh, in order to work on the x6 kernel uh the most important part is memory management because uh, no matter which part of the code you see you will encounter the memory management features so we continue our discussion on memory management now what had we seen in earlier class on memory management that there is a part of the processor called mmu which provides hardware features for memory management the job of the os in a multitasking system is to set up the mmu for a process and then schedule the process so what is the job of compiler now compiler generates object code for a particular os and mmu architecture now once the os has scheduled the process then it is the mmu which detects memory violations and raises an interrupt so because it raises an interrupt it will effectively pass the control to os but uh, it is the job of the hardware to detect memory boundary violations the os code that runs effectively on these violations may punish the process for doing the violation of memory boundaries now we begin with more discussion on linking and loading okay we had seen what linking is now i introduce the word static linking here by static linking i mean that all the object code gets combined at the link time and a big object file for code file is generated uh perhaps this is what we had actually known linking to be but i'm just renaming it to be static linking now and what we knew as loading i'm renaming it to static loading that is taking all the code from the executable file and loading it in memory at the time of exec so we rename what we knew as linking and and loading as static linking and static loading what is the problem with this approach the problem with this approach is first it leads to big executable files and all executable files will carry the object code for standard c library functions within them not only standard c library functions all other library functions also within them so their size will grow second problem is that if you have something like static loading and you are loading the entire code in memory then you are loading those functions which may not even get called so you are unnecessarily occupying memory when a particular piece of the code was actually not going to execute so to solve these problems a uh, advanced scheme of linking and loading is introduced called dynamic linking and dynamic loading now before we see what is dynamic linking what does a linker do now linker basically links function code to function calls and reference to global variable with their external declaration in other files so that is what the linker actually links what does a dynamic linker do now dynamic linker does not combine the function code with the object code file what it actually does is it introduces a placeholder or a stub code that is a indirect reference to the actual code so at the time of loading the program the link loader now and it is being called link loader because it has to understand both linking and loading will be picking up the required or relevant code from the library machine code file like libc so basically the executable file is no longer bigger it is a small file it does not include the machine code of the library functions it includes a indirect reference to the machine code functions of the library functions and that is called a stub or a placeholder code if you observe it using obj dump on some executable so let us say this is a program we simply is doing you can see a scanf and a printf if you do the disassembly of this you will see in the disassembly that in the text section there is in the code of main there is a line like this 
all right to call the printf function now if you try to look at this you will find it not in the text section but in a separate section of the elf file called plt section where the code of printf at plt is simply these three lines so this is the stub code this is the placeholder code the plt section stands for procedure linkage table and remember it's a part of the elf file so this section in the elf file is used to call the external procedures and functions the address of this is to be resolved by the linker now the dynamic linker at runtime because when your program is about to be loaded maybe and why maybe i'll tell you later maybe at that time the functions will be found and loaded in memory now this can be done at the load time or it can even be further postponed to actual function call time but that depends on the loading now so we will now move on to the concept of dynamic loading what does a loader do in our understanding loads the program in memory this is part of exec and uh, we for exec to work it has to know the elf format now what does a dynamic loading or dynamic loader do it will load part of the elf file only if it is needed during execution so not all the code gets loaded at the time of loading only let us say for example only main is loaded or few other functions are loaded remaining part keeps getting loaded as it is needed during execution this can also be called as delayed loading and this is not possible unless there is a more sophisticated memory management done by the os this also needs better support from hardware for particular parts of this and what we are going to do in this lecture and few more lectures in the coming week is we will understand how dynamic linking and dynamic loading are made possible so dynamic linking now necessarily demands an advanced type of loader that understands dynamic linking because if your elf file is having dynamic linking it will have a section like plt which will have the stub that means at the time of loading now the loader has to understand that hey in the elf file there is a plt section and there are stubs so i need to now pick up the code from some other location like the library shared object file that is why the name link loader because the uh, the functionality of the linker and loader gets combined in fact this type of a loader which understands dynamic linking will have to do the job of linking at the time of loading right at the time of loading the linking will be done so the term link loader now even after this whether the loading is static or dynamic that is the choice whether you load it all at the time of exec or on demand when it is needed when the code is to be executed that is still a choice so the question for us is to understand what kind of a hardware is required what kind of operating system data structures are required to manage dynamic linking and loading all right so after having learned this we need now move on to the basic problem of memory management once again and we start our discussion again from continuous memory management but we'll do it very quickly because we have already seen it why are we beginning with this because the scheme called paging that we are going to see in more detail actually derives its logic from the stream of thinking that started with continuous memory management so basically we mean by continuous memory management that the entire process is hosted as a one continuous chunk in ram and if the operating system has to do this then it will divide the memory in two parts one for kernel itself and one for other processes so os gets most typically located in the high virtual memory region because the intro vectors will normally map to these location even in any type of continuous memory management so we have seen this diagram earlier the base and limit scheme which helps us do a relocatable kind of continuous memory management the process could be located anywhere in the ram and the location would be given by this base register or the relocation register and the limit register will be used only to check if an address issued is within the limits or not oops presentation has crashed 
Let me restart. Sharing and task. Now, what happened? I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. Now, with continuous memory management, what are the problems that the kernel faces? First of all, if there is a new process being forked, then a continuous chunk has to be found in the RAM for that. But there are processes uh, which are of different sizes. So the kernel now has to manage the entire available memory to fit in processes of different sizes. Now, this also becomes a parameter in the process control block, the size of the process. Uh, because when the process is over, the data structure related to memory management has to be cleaned up. So the kernel needs to keep track of which region of memory was occupied by the process. So both the base and the size will be maintained in the PCB. But kernel can also maintain additional data structure for managing the different sections occupied by process in memory. So what the kernel does is it maintains a list of free areas and the list of occupied areas, which can be done using a simple array or a link list or whatever you want to do for it. This is a simple problem to solve in terms of data structure. So we have seen this diagram earlier. One way of doing this continuous memory management is using variable size partitions. That is allocate the process the size it requires continuously. And uh, it can lead to this kind of a scheme where let us say you had three processes earlier. Process eight is over, so this becomes free. Then process nine is created. Then process five is over. So this region and this region are free. So this leads to creation of what is called as holes. So this is a hole and this is a hole in the memory. Now the operating system has to maintain the list of regions that are free like this and this and list of regions that are allocated like process 2 and process 9. When new process is created it has to now find a hole for allocating that particular process. So the question is how to find a hole. So suppose let us say there are three free memory regions of size 30k, 40k and 20k and the newly created process required say 15, 1, 5k. Now any one of these three will work, right? Because they are bigger than 15k. So which one to allocate? So the strategies which are used for finding a free chunk, there are three types of them. So let us take an example. Suppose the list of free holes was this, 6k, 17k, 16k, 40k. And the need for the new process was 15k. So the best fit strategy says that find the smallest hole. Obviously, it has to be larger than the process, like equal to or larger than. So 15k is needed. So which is the smallest hole bigger than 15k? It is 16k. So it will fit, find this particular hole. In the worst fit, you find the largest hole. So who is the largest hole? Obviously, even the largest has to be at least as large as the process. So it will find 40k. The first fit says that if you are going to scan sequentially, then find the first hole which is bigger than the process. Once again, bigger or equal. So it will find 17k. So these are the three different strategies. And I think you might have studied this already in some other course where a similar kind of problem might have occurred. Now the problem with this approach is external fragmentation. Like if you had these three chunks, 30k, 40k, 20k, and you wanted 50k, now none of them is 50k, right? But if you do the sum total, it is 90k. Even though you have 90k free, you cannot allocate a 50k chunk. That is the external fragmentation problem. Now how is the external fragmentation problem solved? It is solved with something called as compaction. Now you can see in this diagram that P1, P2 and P3 are on the left side occupying some regions and in between them there are holes of 20k, 50k and 80k. Compaction will move all of them to be continuous and make a 150kb chunk free. This is called compaction. So OS will move the process chunks in memory to make available a continuous memory region. But for this, it has at least moved P2 and P3. So now what happens to the baseline limit pairs for P2 and P3, they'll have to change. 
So it must update the MMU information in the PCB. So that when P2 is rescheduled, it will get rescheduled with the proper MMU setup. This is very time consuming because you have to copy huge chunks of memory from here to there. And it is quite tricky also. And this is only possible if you have the relocation limit scheme available. If you don't have that, you can forget about compaction. Another solution though to external fragmentation is fixed size partitions. In fixed size partition, what the kernel does is it treats the entire memory, as shown in the first part of this diagram, as if it were consisted of equal size partitions. So let us say 50k is the size of each partition. So memory is divided by OS into chunks of equal size. So if you had one MB of total memory, you'll have 20 such chunks. I think I don't have 20 here, I have less, but that is okay. Now, if a process wants memory, then you allocate one or more continuous chunks to a process, such that the total size is more than equal to the size of the process. So if the request is 50K, you allocate one chunk because your chunk size is 50K. If request is 40K, you still allocate one chunk, wasting 10K. If your request is 60k, you allocate two continuous chunks, wasting 40k. This leads to what is called as internal fragmentation. So space wasted in these two cases is called internal fragmentation. Here is a diagram on the right side which shows the same. Let's say the kernel itself is taking two chunks. Process P1 was 50k, so it occupied 50k. One, one full chunk. But P2 was 80k, so two chunks were allocated and 20k is wasted. P3 was 120k, so three chunks were allocated, thus wasting 30k. So this is internal fragmentation. So here now the operating system will have to keep track of which partition is free and which is used by which process. The free partitions, they can be simply maintained as a list or maybe as a bitmap, whatever way. This is not a difficult data structure to maintain. Because you have partition, partitions of a fixed size, the OS data structure becomes quite easy. Now, the PCB of a process will basically contain the list of partitions. It does not have to maintain the base and limit, but just the partition number that is allocated to the process. Now, how to reduce the internal fragmentation? Obviously, the solution is to reduce the size of the partition. If you have one MB partition, you may waste up to 1 MB, but if you have a 4K partition, you will waste only up to 4K. So the question is how small? So if you go to, let us say, as small as 32 bytes, I'll say my, my partition is of 32 bytes, then you will waste very little. Maximum you will waste is 32 bytes, right, for each process. But then there will be so many such partitions and the OS will have to do a lot of job in maintaining those partitions. So smaller partition means more overhead for the OS kernel in allocating and deallocating. More overhead because you have to manage a lot of more partitions. So how small? Uh, so a typical size that people came up with was 4K. And this is a very popular size, although it is not the only norm. 4 MB is also possible and different size of fixed partitions are used by different systems. With this background now, we once again revisit paging. Because paging is basically, logically speaking, an extension of the uh, fixed partitioning scheme. All right. So we'll revisit paging. But before that, any question? Let me check in the chat. No question. I'll wait, I'll wait for a minute. Fine. Let's move on to paging. Paging is an extended version of the fixed size partitions, where partition is basically a page. The process is seen by the compiler and uh, the system itself as if it was a logically continuous sequence of bytes. 
but divided in pages, okay? pages of a fixed size. The physical memory is divided in equally sized page frames. So size of a page and size of a frame is same. Now, what is the distinction between the earlier extended version, earlier fixed size partitioning and this? In paging, the process need not be continuous in run. In the schema we had thought of earlier, with fixed or variable size partitions, the process was still continuous in RAM. In paging, the process doesn't remain continuous in RAM. Any page size chunk can go to any page frame, and there's a page table to map the pages to frame. We have already seen this concept. And now what happens, the address which is generated by CPU is logically seen to consist of two parts, a page number and an offset, right? So here is the diagram which we have studied earlier. Now we revisit it. I'll revise what this diagram means. When an address is issued by CPU, the MMU hardware will split it into two parts one part will be used as a page number as an index index in what is called as a page table this is an in memory continuous table which basically lists the frame numbers for all the pages so when the page number is used as an index in the page table you get a frame number this frame number is combined with the remaining part of logical address you get a physical address Right? This is the paging scheme. And we have seen it earlier. Now, who does what in this schema? What is the hardware doing? What is the OS doing? What is the compiler doing? So compiler assumes that the process is still one big continuous chunk. That's it. Compiler assumes continuous memory. Compiler assumes, oh, in fact, compiler can even assume entire 0 to 4 GP is available for the process and generate the machine code for the for the application then comes into picture the os and that is the kernel and the hardware so what does the hardware do mmu do to convert the logical address to physical address i explained this to you on the earlier slide i'm repeating it it will extract the page number p use it as an index in the page table page table is in ram and page table is one continuous chunk otherwise you cannot index into it but the location of page table is stored in a hardware register uh, like PTBR on x86, page table based register on x86. And it is also stored in the PCB. Why it is stored in PCB? Because you keep doing context switch, right? So when the process is to be scheduled again, the page table based register has to be populated. All right. So you use it to load the hardware register on a context switch. The second thing it now does is extracting the frame number from the page table, combining the page table and the offset to get the final physical address. What does the OS do? OS, when a process is created, fork or exact, at that time it will create a page table for the process. This means first it has to then create a page table fill in the interview of the page table. In the PC, we now maintain the base of the page table and the list of page frames that are allocated to this process. Now, during the context switch, it will the OS will load the PTBR to point to the page table of this process. So this is what the OS does. Once OS does this, then the process is ready to run. The all the memory address translations for the process will be done by the hardware automatically now. The OS will not come in picture again. The process will run as if it is running on its own. But in addition, the OS has to do some global level task, that is a non-process level task, that is maintaining the list of all page frames, because if you don't do that, how will you allocate a page frame to a process? So it will maintain a list of allocated and free frames, both type of frames. This can be done with any simple data structure, like a simple linked list also, or more innovative data structure, uh, like X, XV6 actually uses a linked list, but it's a, you know, a kind of clever scheme of using the linked list, 
that is used in HVC. So we will see that in one of the lectures in coming week. So to summarize the work of OS, this is what OS does as shown in this diagram. There are two parts of this diagram. On the left side, you can see that the gray colored page frames 13, 14, 15, 18, 20. Let us say they are free frames. So OS will be maintaining a list of free frames. It is not necessary that it is in a sorted order. Okay, it is a list. Let us say a new process is coming up and the process says I want four page frames because I have four pages. So what is the job of the kernel now? To pick up any four out of these, allocate them to the process. So when the four are allocated, only one is left in the free frame list. The OS is also going to create a page table and map the page numbers to the frame numbers as you can see here in the page table. So, and then the OS will load the pages actually, as you can see here into the page frames in a non-continuous fashion. So this is what the kernel actually does. When a process is created, it modifies the process related data structure also and the global free frame list also. Now, what is the problem with this paging approach? One major problem, and it's a very big problem, is that every memory access actually results in two memory accesses. So when we say every memory access, we mean every intended memory access. And two memory accesses, why? Because one memory access is the actual memory access that you wanted to do. Second is to the page table. The page table is in RAM. So your processor needs to access the page table located in RAM. Although it is done in hardware automatically, still the time taken is doubled now. The time for memory access gets doubled. So this is done as a part of hardware, but it slows down by 50%. That is the big trouble with paging. So how do you speed up the paging process now? That is done with something called as a TLB. Translation look aside buffer, which is a part of CPU hardware, which is basically a cache of the page table entries. So if you see the diagram now, here is a TLB, which is an array. So it's an array of two entries as compared to page table. Page table simply has a listing of frames. Page table has simply a listing of frames because you can index using a page number and directly get the frame number from here. But the TLB is a subset of the page table. It's a cache of page table entries. It's a subset. So it does not contain all the, it does not contain frame numbers equal in number to the number of pages. It contains less. So it has to maintain both page number and frame number. The TLB is on CPU. It is not in RAM. The TLB is on CPU. So it is very close to the execution unit of CPU. Now what happens when an address is issued by the CPU? When an address is issued, the page number is first searched into the TLB. Now this search, as you can see with these multiple arrows, is a parallel search. It is not a linear search. So it happens in a constant time the search in TLB. If the page number exists, let us say this entry had this page number P, then obviously this is called a hit and you get the frame number that should be mentioned here and your job is done. So in this case, the work was done by hardware. You have only one physical memory access. That is the actual memory, actual location that you wanted to access. But if you don't find it in the TLB, right, then that is called a TLB miss and then the hardware will look up in the page table where it is guaranteed to get it because the page table is supposed to have all the entries. So now if you have a TLB hit, you have one memory access. If you have a TLB miss, you have two memory accesses. So a lot depends on how the TLB is maintained. Now, how is the TLB maintained? Whenever the access go through the page table, the hardware will try to update the TLB to accommodate this recently access entry. Now, TLBs can be maintained uh, using different strategies like the least recently used entries or the most frequently used entries. But irrespective of how it is maintained, the TLB does a speed up. 
Remember TLB access and TLB updation is done by hardware automatically. There is no kernel involved in any one of these. In whatever we see here, is all being done by the hardware. The job of the kernel is only to set up the page table. Right. Now the speed up you get with TLB. To, do, to calculate it, you need to know the hit ratio. Hit ratio is number of times uh, you succeeded in getting the page number in TLB. So it's a ratio less than one or equal to one. So what is the effective memory access time? Hit ratio multiplied by one memory access time plus miss ratio. What is miss ratio? It is one minus hit ratio multiplied by two times memory access time. Because when there is a miss, you have to access two memory locations. When there is a hit, you have to access only one memory location. So here's an example. If the memory access time is 10 nanosecond and hit ratio is 0.8, then the effective memory access time is 12 nanosecond. So yeah, there is a slowdown, but not twice. It is a 20% slowdown because of the TLB, if you have a hit ratio of 0.8. Now, the paging scheme can be further improved to actually support some memory protection. So here is a scheme. Here is the process, page 0, page 1, so it has 6 pages. All right. And here is a page table of the process, in which you will see that there are first 6 entries in the page table, they are marked with the frame numbers 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9. But there is one more entry here called a valid invalid bit. This bit is set to V for first six entries. For the next entry, this bit is set to I. Now, in the most typical paging scheme, what happens? How big will be the page table? That is the question. Page table has to be continuous. But you will say, obviously, a page table, it just depends on the size of the process, right? So, in this case, if the process was, let us say, of size 12,287 bytes, then you divide it by the page size and you get the total number of pages. Those many entries should be there in the page table. All right. So, that is how the OS can calculate the size of the page table. But then it will vary, the size of the page table will vary from process to process. And it is possible that the page table still has entries. Like, for example, the OS may not be in a position to allocate a page table of a, of a very fixed size, uh, of a very precise size for each process. So it may have some extra entries, they can be marked invalid. But most importantly, what happens when such entries are marked as invalid? Now, let us say the, the code was a, let us say, a, a malicious code or somebody was trying to be uh, funny. They were having a pointer pointing to a random address, a very large address. What will happen now? That very large address will map to a page number more than five. And that page entry will map, map to invalid. So now the MMU will detect this and it will raise an interrupt. And it will say that, hey, this was an illegal memory access. So the valid invalid bit, which is a part of the page table entry, can actually be used for that. If you look at x86, then x86 does give you a lot of such bits, not only a valid invalid bit, but there are a lot of bits in the page table entry, which can be actually effectively utilized. Now understand one thing, that if there is a 32-bit page table entry, you don't need all the 32 bits for a frame number, that is a physical page number. Because you don't have 2 raised to power 32 page frames. If your page size is 4K, then you have 2 raised to power 20 page frames, not 2 raised to power 32 page frames. So these remaining bits, they could be used for other meaningful purpose. So just to give you an example, this P bit, that is the present bit, is used to indicate that this page is actually present in the virtual memory addresses of the process. If it is not set, then it's an illegal memory reference. Or this writable can be set to say that the page is writable. Otherwise, the page is only readable and so on. So x86 provides us this interesting page table entry format. 
x86 is what is called as two 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 level paging so it has a pde also but we'll see two level paging in few minutes now before that paging can be used for another very wonderful purpose and that is called shared pages for example library code pages now what is the problem here consider a process p1 and it will have its own code but p1 also uses some c library functions so in its compiled memory image you also have the c library related code let us say taking four pages similarly there is a process p2 it also needs the same functions process p3 which also needs the same functions and in the normal memory paging scheme what we will do for process p1 you allocate pages for this part that is processes own code but you also allocate four pages for this then for process p2 you allocate page frames for this part of the process and you also allocate frames for the library once again same case for p3 so you will end up allocating the pages for library code multiple number of times now that is really not needed because this code is same right the library code is same for all the processes so what is actually done by the kernel for this the kernel should be in a position to understand that a part of the ls file is library code and part of it is not library code kernel should be able to understand that but if kernel can do that what it does it allocates only one instance of pages for the library code and in the page table of all the processes it will do the exact same mapping for the pages related to the library the understand this that in order for this to be successful the library code has to be mapped at the same virtual addresses by the compiler if the virtual addresses start differing then you may not be able to map them at the same place in the page table the mapping will happen at different places in the page table so having the uh, the library functions mapped to the same virtual address makes life little little easier but not doing that doesn't make life impossible it just makes it more complicated but the interesting thing we achieve with paging is that you don't have to load multiple instances of the library code the library code can be loaded only once and that is why now you can recollect why the library on linux is called shared library because the elf file carries enough information to tell the kernel that it's a shared library it has to be loaded only once in memory now ho homework task for all of you is this go to slash proc go to the maps file there is a file called maps we have seen it earlier for each process locate the virtual addresses for c library in each maps file and uh, try to deduce something out of it okay that is your homework another problem of paging is that of a large page table and that is a big problem with 64 bit addresses now all of you have 64 bit processors uh, if you have purchased a computer in last two years uh, now in 64 bit addressing with 64 bit processors the logical address itself is 64 bit so it, if you try to split it into a page number and a offset now p and d then let us say you take 20 bit offset that is d is 20 bit so what does that mean the size of a page will be 2 power 20 that is 1 mb page but what about the remaining 44 bits they will be used for page number so what is the size of the page table now 2 raised to power 44 which is more than a trillion okay it is more than a trillion size page table how will you even be able to fit that kind of a page table right you normally don't have a <laughs> trillion size ram so you can't have that table and in fact if you have a very large process you cannot have that big continuous page table in memory see the problem is the page table is needed to be continuous in memory right so this life becomes very difficult particularly on 64 bit but it is not that easy on 32 bit either on 32 bit if you say that 12 bits are for offset that is a 4k page then you have 20 bits left for the page number 
Even with that, you will have two power twenty. That is nearly a million entries. So you need a uh, nearly a four MB continuous space because one mega entries into four bytes each. You need a four MB continuous space table. Now getting a four MB continuous space maybe is very difficult for every process. So even here the same challenge uh, uh, is there. So the solution people do here is they increase the size of this. So they say four MB page, and then the size of the page table becomes small. But then, if you have four MB page, it leads to more internal fragmentation. So there is a give and take. You know, you don't have a perfect solution here. But the other solution people found was doing hierarchical paging. They said, "See, the problem is the page table is large and continuous. So let's split it. Let us make it hierarchical." So what they said is that the page table will be split into multiple parts, and there will be outer page table which will give us, you know, indices into this particular page table. So you split the logical address in not two but three parts now. The first two parts being the index in the outer page table and the index in the inner level page table. So you use this P1 as an index in the outer page table. Here you get a frame number that is the frame number of the inner page table. In that you use now the P2 as an index, and then you get the final frame number of the actual page frame. In which you use D as an offset. This is called two-level paging, and similarly you can have three-level, four-level paging. All of them get called as hierarchical paging. So why stop at two? You could have three-level hierarchy where you split a 64-bit address into 32, 10, 10, 12, and you have a three-level paging. What is the big problem with hierarchical paging? Every level is one memory access. More number of memory accesses with every level. Every level is one one memory access. So in in the paging scheme, we say it leads us to two memory accesses. But you have two level paging leads to three memory access. You have three level paging it leads to four memory access. It becomes too slow with this. You know, with just one level of paging we had 50% slowdown. Two level of paging 33%. Three level of paging 25%. So it keeps get, getting slow and slow. And further, you have hierarchical paging, so kernel data structures also become more complicated, and you need more kernel memory now to maintain the the data structure for this hierarchical paging. So people came up with a solution, an idea that we will have hash page table. Although hash page table and what are other schemes, they are not very popular. Yeah, but they have been in discussion for a long time. In fact, you see an example of a hash page table in a practical system called Solaris. So what is in the hashing page table? What is the basic idea of hashing? And I am assuming here all of you know hashing because you have done hashing in your second year data structures course. The basic idea of hashing is to reduce the search time by actually using a hash function that gives you index at which you can find the data directly. So here also the same scheme is used. The logical address is split again into two parts, the page number and offset. But the page number is not used as an index in the page table. The page number goes through a hash function that is used as an index in the hash table. It is expected that right here you find the frame number. It is expected because if the hashing is successful, you should find the frame number immediately here. But as you know, with all hashing schemes, there is a problem of collision that multiple page numbers here can map through the hash function to the same index and then obviously you cannot have the frame number there because which frame number will you store. So the solution is various possible schemes of collision resolution. Here is a scheme that is called chaining. So here the page Q and page P which collided into this index, entries for both of them are kept. So S is the frame number for Q and R is the frame number for P. So what happens now? We use P, P uh, as the page number that goes through the hash function. Come here. Oh, not a single, there is no single entry here. There are multiple entries. So now you do a linear search. You find this entry R, you get R and combine it with T. So a lot of things happen, right? A lot of things happen. 
Now the question is who does what? What is done by the MMU? What is done by the OS? And there is no clear cut answer to this in terms of who can do what. Anyone can do anything. But at the moment, you, you try to push things into the hardware that if you say, oh, all of this will be done automatically in the hardware. Then see, you are saying that your hardware, CPU will have a, will have a concept of hashing. The CPU will understand a chaining. It will do the linear search and so on. That CPU will become extremely costly because building this logic in the CPU hardware is definitely possible, but it is going to be extremely costly. More and more logic in the CPU increases the cost because you have to design and implement a very complex, uh, complex hardware. Further, what can be said that maybe we say that the hashing is done by the by the CPU, the hash table itself is in the RAM, but th this hash table is in the RAM, but the lookup this lookup is done by the CPU. If there is a single entry, wonderful, it is still done by the CPU. But if there is no single entry and there is a collision, then there is an interrupt and OS code will run and OS will do this linear search. All right, so you can say this, right? This, this, is a, this kind of a scheme can be designed to make it a practical solution. We will see an example of hash page table in few minutes. The other idea people came up with was inverted page table. So here is the scheme which explains inverted page table. But before we understand this, what is the motivation for inverted page table? So the motivation is this. This is RAM. All right, this is RAM. Now you have a process P1 and a page table for process P1. You have a process P2 and a page table for process P2. A process P3 and a page table for a process P3 and so on. Now, all of them think as if the entire RAM belong to them and that is why these page table entries have a mapping to the same RAM. This is going to map to the same RAM. This is going to map to the same RAM. Now, if you have 1000 processes, you will have 1000 page tables, all of them mapping to the same page frames in the physical RAM. Now, you can have more processes or less processes, but not more RAM. Your RAM stays the same. And the big problem with paging is the page table. You need a long page table, right? And many such page tables. So why not think ULTA, inverted way? That no matter how many processes I have, they will still have to be contained within the same physical memory. So I will not map a page number to a frame number because the page numbers are for every process. What I'll do rather, I'll map the frame number to page number. So if this is the physical memory, and this is frame one, frame two, frame three, I will not have a page table. I rather have a frame table. So in this diagram, although it says a page table, this is in fact a frame table, because if you index it with a frame number, if you index it with a frame number, it will give you a page number. It is a ULTA page table. All right. But what is the problem with this? If this was my physical memory, then the physical memory is shared by multiple processes. So this frame F1 may belong to process 1. This frame F3 may belong to process 2 and so on. So in the entry in the page table, you cannot, this is an inverted page table, you, you will not be storing only the page number, but also the PID of the process to which this page belongs. And this is one global table. This is not a per process table. This is one global table and this is the only table you have. There are no, there are not going to be now per process tables. So you save a lot of memory in, in you know, that you were going, giving for page tables earlier. Now, how do you actually convert a memory address? See, remember the memory addresses are still logical addresses carrying page number and offset. Now what the hardware needs to do, it needs to extract the page number from the logical address and now search in this entire table looking for the page number. Why search? Because you cannot do that as an index because this table is not according to page number but frame number. Frame number is an index, it is not the page number. So this has to be completely searched and then you find the page number. Now, because 
the page number will be with the PID, the search should also involve the PID and the page number both. Now in this diagram, although it is shown that there is a P and there is a D and there is a PID as a virtual as a virtual or logical address, the PID is actually not generated by CPU. Okay. The PID is indicative of let us say some value in a register which is loaded by the kernel when the process is executing. All right. So it is not generated by the CPU like the logical address otherwise. It is it is maybe a value in the register. So that value in the register and this page number are used to search in this table. And then you get a page number. The index of this page number is your frame. The index of this page number sorry the index of this entry is the frame number so you get the frame number this is the effective address so this is the inverted page table scheme so in the normal page table that is one per process leads to too much memory consumption inverted page table global table only one table so you now need to store the pid in the table entry because it is one table so you have to indicate which entry belongs to which process now some examples of systems using inverted page table is the 64-bit UltraSpark and PowerPC. You can read more about that on your own. The difference is now here the virtual address is a triple, that is the PID, the page number and offset. We now do the case study of the Oracle Spark Solaris system, which is a 64-bit processor and a 64-bit Solaris kernel system. It uses hash page tables. All right. So this system has two hash tables, one for the kernel code data, etc., and one for all processes. So there are two, one separately for kernel, one for all processes. Every entry in the hash table, this is a further improvement, it's just not a page number, but it is basically a base plus span where span is number of continuous pages. So what Solaris does is to reduce the size of the hash table. It does not have a mapping between each page and each frame. So when it tries to allocate memory to a process, it also tries to allocate frames continuously. So let us say it, if it allocates frame number 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, what it will store is not 6 entries in the page table. It will store only one entry saying that base is three and span is six pages. All right, so this way you, you reduce the size of the table also. Further, now the caching is done at three levels. See, no matter whether it is inverted page table or hashing or hierarchical paging, in all of them, the TLB doesn't go away. The TLB stays. So we did not mention TLB in all our discussion. Yeah, but it is there. Without TLB, it is impossible to get performance. So what Solaris Spark does is it has a TLB that is on CPU. But even for the table, page table, it does a caching. There is a TSB which is in memory and then there is a page table in memory. So the CPU has a TLB that is basically holding the translation table entries for fast hardware lookups. So these are entries which translate the uh, page number through hashing to the frame number. Now, a cache of these will reside in an in-memory translation storage called TSP, which includes an entry per recently accessed page. Uh, when a virtual address reference is there, the hardware will search in the TLB. So, obviously, the first search is in TLB. This is in hardware. If it is not found, so there is a miss, there is a TLB miss. Entry that corresponds to the particular virtual address. If you find it in TSB, that is the TSB hit, it will be copied into the TLB and then your job is done. But if it is not found in TSB, then a hardware interrupt is raised. So far, our entire work was being done in the, in the hardware. Now hardware interrupt is raised and kernel runs to search the hash table. So once the kernel finds it, kernel will create a TT entry from the hash table, store it in the TSB also, and also for loading into the TLB. 
Finally, when the interrupt controller, interrupt handler is over, the control will return to the MMU, which will complete the address translation and then it will retrieve the requested byte from main memory. So there is this three level of hierarchy in Oracle Spark and it's an interesting case of implementation of hash page tables. Your x86 operating system uses two level of hierarchical paging. Linux kernel also uses hierarchical paging. Now the last simple concept related to paging is swapping. You have heard the word swap earlier, right? As in a swap partition on Linux. So the notion with which the word swap partition is used on Linux is close to what we are discussing, but not the same. So we have a paging system, all right? Now, to understand this diagram, I draw another diagram. So this is your RAM. And in this RAM, you had a process P1 and a process P2 and a process P3 and some free space or no free space. Now, there is a process P4 which is getting forked. And you don't have sufficient memory to allocate. Okay. Remember, although I have shown them continuously, they need not be continuous in memory. You don't have sufficient memory. So now what should happen? You can say fork will fail. I don't have sufficient frames to allocate. But there is another solution to this. Although you have three processes in memory, you are not running all of them. You are running only one of them at a time. And P4 is about to be 4. So what can be done is you say, I will take out the process P1 from the RAM and put it into a backing store like a hard disk. So this can be your swap partition. You put the entire process onto the swap partition. And then the new process P4 can be allocated pages. Now this can apply even when you are not going to fork a new process because with this you can actually allocate processes more than your RAM because the very moment I said I am going to allocate RAM for a P4 the total RAM allocation for P1, P2, P3, P4 was more than the total RAM I had so what, what, what will happen now so P1 is taken out, P4 takes its place but now when P1's turn comes for execution what will you do you will swap out one of these and swap in P1 again, right? So the swapping out and swapping in of the processes will continue from RAM to hard disk to hard disk to RAM. Backing store could be hard disk or whatever, pen drive or TA or whatever, you know, so that depends what kind of a backing store you have. In the standard swapping, entire process is swapped in or swapped out. That is the case with continuous memory management. But if you have paging and if you want to employ swapping with paging, then it is not necessary to swap out complete process, but you can just swap out some pages. Now, so the term we use there is called paged out. Okay. A page is paged out and some page is paged in. All right. And the term paging now, <laughs> funnily, refers to paging with swapping. So very often, uh, when you read the literature, it also becomes confusing because the word paging is used with two meanings. Paging to indicate the paging memory management scheme, but paging also to indicate the very process of getting paged out and paged in. So be careful when you are reading about what is it being referred to. So we will now henceforth use the words paged out. Paged out means a page is being taken out of RAM, put in into backing store, Paging in means it is getting loaded from the backing store into the RAM once again. So here is a diagram once again which shows paging with swapping. Process A and process B. So these three pages of the process A are swapped out. So they are on the backing store. While these three pages are right now getting paged in for the process B. So some pages can be in memory, some pages can be on backing store. That is possible. The last word of caution is it is not as simple as it sounds. It's a very, very challenging thing to write this code in OS kernel. Implementing it is very non-trivial. Why? Why is it non-trivial? Because here we are talking about, let us go to the paging. 
we are talking about the memory access now you are saying the memory access is trying to find the page but the page is not there in memory so for one memory access now you have to schedule io to bring the page from back in store to memory so your io system and your paging system will now get combined so memory management is no longer memory management memory management is now requiring io life becomes very complicated when you start doing that so anyway i'll stop here there is a question in the chat can first fit solve all problems of external internal factors obviously no none of them can solve all problems first fit or best fit or worst fit no it cannot because fragmentation remains the fitting problems don't solve the fragmentation problem at all they are not meant to solve fragmentation problem they are just aimed at finding a chunk faster that's it that is their aim their aim is not to solve fragmentation problem so any other question does process stack and he have pages as well yes the entire memory image of the process is mapped in the page table including code data stack and he all of them get mapped in the page table otherwise how will that access happen you have a paging hardware so everything has to go through the paging so page table has to be set up for all of them code data stack and he everything and not only that now i will also include the shared library in that the shared library also has to be mapped in the page table when do we remove the pages of shared library normally they don't get removed because as far as the standard c library is concerned every other process needs it so they don't get removed they can get removed only when there is a pressure on the memory and you want to page out so they may become the victims of the page out thing and they may get moved out but removed very unlikely only when the last process using the library uh, is over you can remove them okay let's stop let's stop now we'll continue in the next week now